mass over there. It's fantastic. Now, I believe that we're filming this. So if you'd like to film from now, that would be great. And don't put it on YouTube, my little, getting my reverb right. Um, we're going to look at the parables. And as we think about the parables and think about uh, uh, what they have to say to us, often what we need to realize is that as we look at the parables, God really speaks to us in power and in strength and will reveal things to us. So we're going to look at five key parables as we gather together and really understand uh, what God's heart is for us. The first parable I want to share with you is the parable of the hidden treasure and the pearl. The kingdom of heaven is in Matthew chapter 13 and 40, verse 44 and 46. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he had it again and then in his joy went and sold all he had and brought that field. Again the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for a fine pearl and when he had, had found one great value he went away and sold everything he had and brought it. It's a remarkable story and it's a story that you probably know from from children's church and from growing up in church and understanding about the whole story about the guy that finds the treasure in a field and goes away and sells everything to gain it and to, to really connect with it. The remarkable thing about this parable is the way that Jesus ties our sacrifice with the great eternal value of the kingdom of God. And right in as we jump into this scripture, let's understand something. That, that what God is looking for us in our own lives and our walk with Him is our willingness to sacrifice absolutely everything for Him. That great sacrifice. That sacrifice where we're willing to say, you know what, I am utterly and completely willing to give all, everything up to Jesus Christ to follow Him in my life. See, the Christian faith is about sacrifice. Yes, of course. It's about the sacrifice of God, His great Son on the cross for us. And it's our response to that sacrifice that we're saying, Yes, Lord, come and, and speak. Come and work. I am willing to give all that I have up to gain the great prize of this treasure that God has for us. The problem is we forget that our faith is a treasure. What you've got is remarkable. The treasure of God that is in your life is incredible. It is a treasure within our lives. It's a gift. See, if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you know that the Lord Jesus Christ is your Lord and Saviour, and He has changed your life, that is a gift from God that has come fundamentally by a revelation by God's Spirit to your heart. Think about that. God has revealed it. Here you are, in Green Bay, with your children, on a Bible camp, willing to sit here right now, when you could be in Starbucks, but you want to hear the Word of God preach. I say amen, otherwise it would be very lonely for me. I, I want to hear the Word of God preach. Why do you want to be here? Why do you want to open Scripture together? Why are you willing to bring your family to be discipled? Because you were raised in a religious colony? Because you were once... From a family of Amish or Hutterites out there because it's your tradition. No, actually, it is because in your life at some point you had the thing that made the Christian faith so unique. You had a revelation from God that you got it, you saw it, and you knew that Christ is King and that He changes our lives. You're here because of a revelation. I love that word, don't you? Revelation. I wish I was black at this moment. I could really give it a bit of... But I'm not. Um, I'm English and I drink tea. Revelation. If I was American, I could say, turn to the person next to you and say, Revelation. <laughs> but Canadians don't do that. Because you're all nice. Um, um, I mean, mean conservative. And... <laughs> 
revelation. Revelation is where God has revealed something to you that other people haven't seen. Christianity is a religion of revelation. God coming to you and revealing you something that you haven't seen. And that's how we got saved. I mean, I am a pagan. I once was. I was once a great pagan. I was teenager, rebellious, sent to a private school to be educated. <laughs> I was expelled. I was, I was in a gospel service that I was went to because I really liked a girl. It happens. And I went with her and I sat there, not really thinking about the preacher, not thinking about my sin, but I was thinking about other things. And as I sat there, suddenly... Bang! I knew I needed a saviour. It was revelation. Now I'm from a third, fourth generation heritage of pagans and atheists and non-believers. You may have a great heritage of Christianity which I bless God for. But there was a point even in your life when you got it and it changed you. Do you know what that's called? The treasure. The treasure. The treasure of God. It is remarkable that this is a great value. And it comes. And it's a man who discovers the treasure like a merchant or who purchases a pearl stands for anyone becoming a child of the kingdom. That is a disciple of Jesus. In this sense, there are two emphases in each of these two little parables. But it seems natural to frame the parable message with a short sentence. So let me give you a short sentence. The kingdom of God is so valuable that it's worth sacrificing everything and everything to gain it. Give it all up. Hand your life over. In fact, as one great theologian wrote in his book on parables, Bloomberg, he wrote in his preaching the parables, he said, in fact, with rare exception, we see precisely the opposite in the American church. He's an American theologian. So can Ours is a culture which religious commitment, including Christian activity, functions as a kind of add-on to our real priorities. When convenient, we go to church or get involved in this program or small group. When it's not too much at stake, we will witness or stand up for the model of Christian integrity in the workplace. When I read those words, it made me realise something, that the danger with Christianity in the Western world, in Europe, in North America, is this, that our Christian faith becomes an add-on, not an all-in. And what the parable teaches us, actually, is this, is that is that you can't have a half-hearted approach to Christianity. It's not an added on extra curriculum activity where you are a bit religious and you sort of go to church and you kind of believe in God. No, Jesus is teaching you sell everything and you're going to get a treasure that's going to change your life. Wow. See, I have add-ons in my life. I don't know about you. Um, this year, I got a new add-on. And that new add-on was, um, I bought a fly rod. I've never fly fished in my life. And so I bought this, this, this fly rod. I had this sense, this urgency to become a fly fisherman. I found if I was watching, you won't believe this how I it. I was watching, has anybody ever watched the series Foyle's War? Yes, I love it. You love it, I sister. <laughs> See you later on Netflix. And Foyle's War is wonderful. It's, yes. it's, sorry? PBS. Ah, oh, PBS, yes, I hope you made your donations. Um, <laughs> you know, I always feel guilty at the end. It's like those evangelists. Um, <laughs> oh, I've just watched Morse, and oh, I've got to give some money. Ah! <laughs> but I haven't. Um... <laughs> Uh, but 
I, I, I was watching, I watched the whole lot, and I was watching it, and he goes fishing in the war, and he is he's a kind of, anyway, Google it. And, and, and I thought, oh, I want to become a fly fisherman, because in England, we don't really, only the rich really do fly fishing. Because you can't get to the rivers, because they charge you for going, and because they charge you for every fish you catch, and they charge you for everything. It's just, it's just a rich man's sport. In, a, in the Okanagan, everybody fly fishes. So I've, I've been out to the park, and I've started to go 2 o'clock, 10 o'clock, 10 o'clock, 2 o'clock. I'm a little dyslexic. And I'm going backwards and forwards and I'm practicing so I don't whip it and break it. And I'm in the park. And this is a new added thing in my life. This year, I have not yet cast into water. <laughs> I've just had lessons in the park. Caught a clump of weeds. And, and I just have been doing and I've had like three lessons with a brilliant five fishing guy in my church. He takes me out and I'm there practicing it and doing it. This is a new add-on in my life. By the end of the summer I would have gone and, and fished in a Okanagan lake and caught many, 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 many fish. By faith I am saying that, okay? I'm going to go and try. But you see, if fly fishing is an add-on and I will choose to do it, it's difficult because I preach all weekend. But when fly fishing becomes my life, it's no longer an add-on. It becomes the focus. And what happens is that faith can become an add-on. It does not consume us. And Jesus isn't looking for you just to have an add-on. He's looking for your whole life, your whole commitment. Why? because you've received a treasure that is for eternity. So don't let it be an add-on. Allow it there. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field which a man found and covered up. Then his joy, in his joy, he goes and sells that all that he has and buys that field. In his joy. This is what we lack in our Christian faith is that we've forgotten that it's a joyous faith. I love my faith. I love my relationship with God. I love the joys. I will gladly give up anything. I will confess everything. I will repent of all in my life. I will bow my knee to Jesus because I have found freedom and it is joyous. It is wonderful. I love being a Christian, which is good news, isn't it? As I'm your preacher. <laughs> It'd be terrified that he said, I, I hate being a pastor. <laughs> it's so terrible. Oh, being a Christian is such a burden. Honestly, I'm really depressed. <laughs> that would be just not the best camp speaker, would it? <laughs> Thanks, Phil, for coming. He's the most depressing speaker you've ever met. I gave my life to Jesus and it just got worse and worse. <laughs> no, it's joy. Now, it doesn't mean it's not hard, that life isn't tough, that we don't have battles, because although we, the kingdom of God has started for us, we're still in a fallen world and in a battle. Let me tell you a story about Terry Herbert. Terry Herbert, you can remember his name and you can Google him as well. He's got nothing to do with Foyle's War. But that would be a good little series if you're into... Anyway, well, I don't know how good the internet is here. Terry Herbert, 1991, Terry Herbert had a marvellous moment in his life. He had, he discovered something that he wanted to devote the rest, well not the whole, probably the rest of his life to. This kind of embarrassed his teenage children. Because Terry Herbert would be found on misty English mornings in the middle of a field with a special little gadget. You've seen them. They appear. They're out there. They're these strange people who go out and purchase these things. They go out and they purchase a metal detector. Have you seen these weird people? Are you one of those? No? I'm not so sure. But 
But you go out, you'll see them on this beach if they were here, because then everybody left into the embarrassment of their children. Harry, Terry, even, would go out and he would put on his little, whatever they are, ear things, switch it on, and even the other day, I watched somebody on Okanagan Beach going along after we'd all finished our lovely day, looking for things and sweeping backwards and forwards and trying to find any little hidden treasure. He did this from 1991. I reckon he would have driven his wife mad. Family holidays, early mornings. He then joined the association, the British Association of Metal Detecting People. I don't know if that's their official name, but it sounds like the Sorry, it's so nerdy. And, but yeah, you go. Until one Saturday morning in Staffordshire. That's Staffordshire, which is north of Worcestershire, where the source comes from. You know the source? We mine it in Worcestershire. We have a pipeline that goes to the ocean, but we've got problems with the Aborigines because of uh, land rights. Those are the Welsh. And the Welsh are creating all kinds of problems for us. But we're trying to get it out of Worcestershire and get it to your stakes, right? So he's in Staffordshire, north of Worcestershire, 15 miles from where I live, one morning, Early, he's in the middle of a field and he's going along. Suddenly, he hears that sound that is magic to him. <laughs> and he looks around, ah! Oh, and he starts to dig and he spots something. <laughs> it's going completely mad. He starts to dig more. He digs more. He runs to the farmer. He says, I think I have found a hoard. A hoard is a technical term for treasure. And indeed, Terry Herbert had discovered the largest amount of Saxon gold ever discovered in the British Isles, dated from something about, I guess, 700 AD in a Staffordshire field. It's now in a museum. It's wonderful. You can, you can look at it, the Sa Staffordshire Saxon Horde. If I had, I could have a look at pictures of it. It is magnificent. And he shared it, this wealth with the farmer and he received 3.6 million pounds. That's about five million dollars for going near, near. Near. I bet his kids were happy that he went on the beach. He got his reward. The thing that struck me about this true story of, of, of Terry was that he was willing to not give up and keep searching for the treasure. And the treasure that he eventually found changed his whole life. I mean, come on, $5 million from a field would change many of our lives, amen? I don't think we're going to find much Saxon gold in Canada, though. Because we probably won't. <laughs> Unless we live in Alberta, where they find everything, don't they? Yeah. Why not? <laughs> They just, you know, people leave Cologne and it's like, where are you going? I'm going to earn money. Where? Fort McMurray. Whoa. Have you been there? Um, <laughs> they're, they're striking it rich up there. But the treasure that he dug. Now, of course, in the ancient world, it links Terry to a Saxon king to Jesus. Why? Because Jesus is given an illustration that every peasant farmer knew and dreamed of. Because there was no way in the ancient world for many of these people ever to be rich or successful. They were slaves. There was the super rich and then the peasant society. 
And stories used to go around in the ancient world of kings and rulers that would bury their gold because there was no royal back of Canada. And they would bury their, their gold and then they would perhaps get killed in a battle, in a war. And years and centuries later, a poor peasant would dig up and find this treasure. And by the right, even in Jewish law, and he could buy that land, that treasure would be him if he's willing to pay the price. This happened in 700 AD in Staffordshire because some Saxon king buried his gold, went out and fought a Celtic king or a, a Welsh tribe and was killed and never came back to that spot until Terry came and found the gold. You found gold, Jesus is saying. What you've got in your life is so precious, so incredible, so enhancing, so life-changing, so amazing, that you must sell everything and give everything, Jesus is saying, to gain the kingdom of God. Don't hold back. Give everything to Jesus, is what he's saying. Give everything to this. And we understand seven truths about treasure. Well, first of all, from God's heart, he calls Israel his treasure. If God calls Israel his treasure in Exodus 19 and 5 or Psalms 135 and verse 4, let me tell you something from God's perspective. You are his treasure completely. He's a treasure. Adorable. You are his treasure. It's, it's, it's hard to get our head around. My wife, her love language. Have you done, anybody done love languages? Okay. My wife's love language is gifts. It's expensive. <laughs> Why can't it be, you know? Anyway. <laughs> You know what I'm thinking? It's gifts. So I bless my wife and I have to remember to leave gifts all the time. In fact, one day I went on a preaching trip many, many years ago and she said, you need to stop telling this story because you haven't done it since. But I left all little presents all over the house, all in little places. And I left them all over. And while I was traveling, I was, I was at some Billy Graham event in, in, in Charlotte. And I, uh, she was back in England, and I text her every hour and say, oh, go behind the fridge and feel there. There's a little present for you. Guys, I know you hate me at this moment. And, and go over here, and there's a little, ha, uh, ha. Uh, and, and, and when I got back after a week away, I had a week of gifts all hidden. Your mother-in-law's coming round here, you know, so I text and said, there's a bottle of whiskey. And um, <laughs> that is a joke. <laughs> A joke. <laughs> Just for the little punchline, a little twist. Not really. It was brandy. And <laughs> not really, that's another joke. It was Thornton's chocolate, English beautiful chocolate. And and she did that. So I got a great I, I, I returned and she was so happy to see me. If you were to measure God's love and God's treasure by a gift to you, He gave His Son so that you could have salvation. If God's love is measured by a gift, then He's given you everything. Everything. You're His treasure. He calls Israel his treasure, you're his treasure. And so don't put yourself down. Don't allow insecurities to wreck your life. Don't criticize yourself or think you're, you're of no value or you're useless. You are a treasure of God's heart. Humanity. He reaches humanity with the power of God's love. You are his treasure. And if we were Americans right now, I'd tell you to turn to the person next to you and say, you are a treasure. No, it's not going to happen. <laughs> From God's perspective, 
heavenly treasure has far more valuable even than earthly treasure laying up valuables. He wants you to understand this. From God's position, the godly will treasure the fear of the Lord. We, we, we treasure the fear of the Lord. This isn't a kind of fear like, oh, there's a rattlesnake. That's fear, isn't it? That's not the fear of the Lord. My daughter is on the camp down in Oliver. She's there for three weeks working as a volunteer at church camp. And on that um, uh, First Nations land, uh, there, this, last week I said, how many rattlesnakes came into the camp? And she said, oh, we only had 10 dad. So that's a lot in my book. 10. I said, oh, good. And they got rid of it. Oh, yes, dad. I said, oh, good. How's our camp? Uh, Rattlesnake fence working then. I don't think it's working very well. It takes a while to sort it out. But but she was she wasn't bothered. She she got used to that. But I know that when any of us see a rattlesnake, it's like ah! fear of a rattlesnake is a neg is a positive thing because you run. A negative thing because you don't want God like that, do you? So what does the fear of the Lord mean? You know, when we think about the fear of the Lord, think more of a holy, magnificent awe of the vastness of God, that God is so great. Think of C.S. Lewis's words when the beaver spoke and the children said, he's a lion? I don't know if I should want to meet a lion. And then the beaver says, oh, is he safe? And he says he's good, but he's not safe. Because Aslan, Aslan's on the move. It's that kind of awe that when you meet a gorgeous, massive lion and you see its power and its strength, you love it, but you know it's not quite safe, and yet you, you know that there is an awe, a majesty, a power, a strength there, and you wanna, wow. It's like standing on the edge of Niagara Falls, but times that a million times when you understand the greatness of God. That's the fear of the Lord. And when you receive that moment, Scripture says it's a treasure in your life. And we understand this. From God's opinion, as incredible as it sounds to modern ears, a person is better off disposing of all of their wealth to gain the kingdom than it is to lose your soul. And from God's his own deposit of a treasure that is in you, jars of clay. 2 Corinthians 4, 7 to 18 explains this. So I hope you understand that when we receive this treasure, this treasure changes our lives. We perhaps haven't got time to jump into the pearl. But the pearls have always, pearls are only mentioned seven times in the scriptures. But pearls are always linked to the pearly gates, to revelation, to the great beauty, shining, hard, glorious, beautiful pearls. They were seen for royalty. Cleopatra was known in the ancient world for her, those pearls. But pearls represent pearls of wisdom. Pearls of the gospel, but they represent pearls of eternity, of the coming kingdom. That you sell everything because actually we will rise again and we will live forever. You're going to live forever. That's the promise of the Christian faith. It started now. There will be a new heaven, new earth. You will participate in that. It is the promise of the Christian faith. If you take away the reality of, of eternity, you lose what Christ did upon the cross. So, 
Now, let me land this a little bit for you. First of all, I want what are the I want to understand the value of the kingdom and how much it's worth. True discipleship disciples is worth sacrificing whatever to take it. Have you been a bit half-hearted in your Christian faith? Have you lost the joy of the discovery of the treasure? The cost of the kingdom is what we must be willing to give up. It's about His will, not your will. It's about giving up. There is a hiddenness of the kingdom that that we've got to be willing to say, you know what? I'm not going to be apathetic. I'm going to seek it actively. And I want to know God's presence more and more as days go by, as years go by, as life changes. Apathy. And I laugh about Terry, and you can Google him and see his great big hoard of sacks and gold and his little wandering around and with his nee, nee, and, you know, but he's the one laughing now he's new five million. Hey, well done Terry. But the thing I love about Terry Herbert is this. He was systematic in his devotion to seeking the treasure and one day he found the greatest treasure. Don't be inconsistent. Don't be apathetic. There is part of our relationship with God that is a treasure hunt. And don't stop hunting. Don't stop seeking. Don't stop going for it in your life. And we come up across the kingdom in the most wonderful way. So, I went and prayed for an hour before I came and preached to you. I always do that. I always pray for an hour, a couple of hours. Because it's the, it's the power of the Spirit that changes lives. And I sensed in God's heart a number of things for you this morning. And this is where I want to land it. So I guess as I was praying and asking the Lord and just going, what do you have to say to this scripture for this lovely group of people on their holiday? I think the Lord just wants to remind us that we found a great treasure. We need to understand that treasure. That the treasure you found, if you really understand it, will change the whole of your life. You see, I was as a non-Christian and as a fleshly Christian, selfish, jealous, angry, insecure, Bitter, hurt individual. But I've so sought the treasure in my life that I've allowed it to change me to more like I'm on the journey to being the person that Christ wants me to be. So, what am I trying to say? I'm trying to say, friends. Don't find the treasure and put it in a museum and visit it on Sunday mornings every other week and a small group in the fall and the spring. But allow the treasure to change your life now. See, I thought about this as I was thinking that Terry found the treasure, he sold it to the British government, they all have agreement, but then he would go out and enjoy the benefits of selling this treasure. There are benefits to being a Christ follower. There are gifts that come with being a Christ follower. 
There is the power of forgiveness. There's the power of freedom. There's the breaking of bondage of sin. There's a new life. There's a joy in the face of darkness. There is so much to our treasure. And what we've got to learn to do is not stick it in a museum. But we've got to learn to enjoy what Christ has given us. That he wants to answer our prayers. He wants to whisper to us. He wants to make himself real for us. Don't put it in a museum. And visit it twice a week. Take it and its benefits. See, for a peasant in Galilee, to find a hoard of treasure would change his whole life. It would purchase land so that it could be self-sufficient. He wouldn't be under the power of the taskmaster. He would find freedom from slavery. He would find freedom for his children. He would find a new life, a new beginning, a new hope. And when Jesus told this parable, everybody went, yes, it's like winning the lottery. How many of you do the lottery? Don't put your hands up. My father-in-law loved the lottery. He did it on Michelle's dad. I loved him to bits until he died. He found Christ and he got saved. He was a hard-drinking, hard-fighting, haulage man who roaded for the rolling star stones and, and for the animals. The only group he never worked for were the Beatles, and he loved the Beatles. Until one day in his 50s, the power of God fell on him, and he repented and gave his life to Jesus. You'd have loved him. He smoked all his life, and it killed him. But it's a, he, will, he will have a new body one day. But he used to sit there, and he used to say, I've done the lottery, Phil. Uh, I wasn't so bothered. I was just glad he was saved. And then he'd tell me all the things he was going to buy. Oh, he was always going to buy us a big house with a camp where we could have a youth camp and we could minister with a lake. And he was always looking for these locations around Britain so he could buy us a youth camp. I don't, I don't want a youth camp. <laughs> I'd like a house on Kelowna by the lake. But... Um, it was great though. Because he knew what, I guess he knew as a, as a man how this would change his world. If the power of the cross, the reality of Christ, hasn't radically changed our world, then we've got some work to do. Because what it says on the tin, <coughs> is that it's a treasure that will alter your whole life. And the saddest thing is, we have churches full of people that have been exactly the same for 30 years. And the power of Christ has not revolutionized their lives. It's a treasure, it's a pearl, and it starts by giving everything up. Let's pray. Even now in your heart, decide it starts with giving everything up for Jesus. Surrendering all. So why don't you do that in your heart right now? Lord Jesus, I pray that we have the courage to give up everything, to let go and to let God, and to seek the treasure in our lives, in Jesus' name. Amen. Tomorrow will be the parable of the mustard seed. It's the mustard seed and the life of a hobbit. So I'm going to talk to you about the power of the hobbit. Come back if you dare. Amen. Thank you, Bill.